Gentlemen, um, thank you for uh, coming out on a Sunday morning quite so early. I, it's, uh, I personally found it quite a challenge this morning, so thank you for getting here for this time. Um, I would uh, like to introduce our um, panel here today for uh, fighting for new laws. Uh, obviously, one of the most important parts of um, the whole topic that we've been discussing and, and hearing about over the weekend. Um, and uh, I look forward to, to hearing some of the, the ideas coming from this table. Um, ben Emerson, who um, uh, thankfully most of these people don't need very much introduction because <laughs> they're all very well known in their field. Um, and I will ask each of them, because I am standing in for Laura Flanders, who is a much better presenter and uh, understands all of these things than me. But Ben Emerson um, is the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Terrorism at the UN and uh, has um, a, a vast biog, which you will have seen in, on your sheets of paper there. Um, I'm going to let Ben tell you anything else that he wants to tell you about himself. Gavin Miller, um, equally um, eminent and uh, a friend of CIJ. Chair of CIJ. Chair of CIJ and friend of okay. CIJ. I think the both things are allowed. You have to do one to do the other. Right? Uh, thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. Carly Nib, um, I'm sure, again, you will introduce yourself. And Carrie Shankman, US lawyer. Um, involved with uh, Julian Assange's case most recently. So um, without any further um, waffling from me, I'll hand over to Ben to start off what will be a very interesting session. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I approach this, as you will probably um, uh, have gathered, from, first of all, a UN perspective, that's to say a global perspective, rather than the legislation or practices or programs enacted or applied by any individual state. Uh, and I approach it uh, uh, specifically from the position of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in Article 17, uh, the right to privacy. Um, as probably most of you know, in December uh, of last year, the General Assembly uh, of the UN adopted Resolution 68-167 stroke on the right to privacy in the digital age. It was a resolution co-sponsored by 57 member states and adopted without a vote. Uh, in that resolution, the General Assembly uh, affirmed, uh, which is actually a rather important principle, uh, that the right to privacy in Article 17 uh, must be protected online uh, and called upon all states to review their procedures, practices, and legislation related to communications, surveillance, interception, uh, and collection of personal data, emphasizing the needs for states to ensure the full and effective implementation uh, of their obligations uh, under international human rights law. That set in train uh, a flurry of activity at UN level, uh, and in June of this year, uh, in accordance with the uh, mandate given by that resolution, the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, submitted her uh, central report to the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, uh, and I submitted my most recent report on the 23rd of October, which looks at the counter-terrorism justification for internet mass uh, surveillance. The, the central message of that report uh, is the not very staggering proposition uh, that mass surveillance of the internet or bulk access to digital communications traffic, as the authorities prefer to describe it, poses a direct challenge to an established norm of international law. States' obligations under Article 17 of the International Covenant include the obligation to respect the privacy and security of digital communications. And that implies, uh, in principle at least, that individuals have the right uh, to share information and ideas with one another without interference by the state, secure in the knowledge that their communications will be uh, read, 
by and will reach the intended recipients alone. M measures that interfere with that right, uh, 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 for those of you who are not lawyers, uh, must be authorised by a provision of domestic law that is accessible to the public and precise and that conforms with the requirements uh, of the covenant. That means that it must pursue a legitimate aim and that it must meet the tests of necessity and proportionality. Now, the growth in states' technological capabilities over the past decade uh, has improved the capacity of intelligence and law enforcement agencies to carry out targeted surveillance of suspected individuals and organisations. And counter-terrorism uh, is the, uh, if you like, paradigm justification. It's what that justification which is most frequently advanced by proponents uh, of greater internet penetration by states, uh, and it is the justification against which, uh, at its outer extreme, uh, proportionality uh, and uh, necessity fall to be judged. There's no doubt, of course, that the prevention, pre pre prevention uh, suppression and investigation of acts of terrorism amount to a legitimate aim for interfering uh, with privacy rights under Article 7, uh, 17. Terrorism uh, can destabilize communities. It can threaten social and economic development. It can fracture the territorial integrity of states, uh, and it can undermine international peace and security. Under Article 6 of the Covenant, states are under a positive obligation to protect citizens and others within their jurisdiction against acts of terrorism. And one aspect of that obligation is the duty to establish effective mechanisms for identifying potential terrorist threats before they have materialized. And states discharge that duty through the gathering and analysis of information by intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Why particularly terrorism? Uh, the enhanced capacity of states to monitor uh, internet traffic is said by uh, uh, state authorities to be of particular significance in the counter-terrorism context because communications via the internet have played an important part in the financing and preparation of acts of international terrorism and because the internet has been used for the purpose of recruitment to terrorist organizations and for disseminating uh, terrorist uh, propaganda. Uh, the prevention and suppression of terrorism uh, is uh, therefore regarded universally within the UN as a public interest imperative uh, of the highest importance uh, and could, in principle, uh, provide an arguable basis for mass surveillance of the Internet. But the intelligence agencies must still comply with international human rights law, merely for them to assert uh, as a, a number of the service chiefs in this country and in the US have done since the Snowden allegations, that mass uh, surveillance technology can contribute to the suppression uh, of terrorism, does not provide an adequate international law or human rights law justification for its use. The fact that something is technically feasible and that it may sometimes yield useful intelligence uh, doesn't by itself mean that it is either reasonable or lawful. There's a crucial distinction for the purposes uh, of Article 17. Uh, states now have the capacity uh, to conduct targeted surveillance of known and pre-identified individuals and organizations uh, 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 using a wide variety uh, of technical sources. Uh, but targeted surveillance, where an individual or organization is already the subject of inquiry, depends on the existence of a prior suspicion against the targeted individual or organization. Uh, and it's the almost invariable practice of states to require some form of prior authorization, uh, 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 whether it's judicial or, as in the United Kingdom, executive, um, and in some states, there is an additional tier of review after the event. But at least where targeted surveillance is an issue, there is an opportunity for an objective assessment to be made of the legality and proportionality of surveillance by reference to the facts of an individual case in advance 
measuring the degree of the intrusion against the anticipated value that the information may have to an investigation. Uh, but as we all now know, uh, some states uh, have uh, uh, the technology to secure bulk access to communications and content data without prior suspicion. Uh, and despite the fact that the focus has been on the US and the UK through the Snowden's revelations on the NSA uh, and GCHQ, be under no illusions that those are the only two states conducting this type of mass surveillance. Russia, China, Israel, France, as well as the Five Eyes community and others are states that we know have these capacities uh, and it is very likely that other states have them too. The authorities in states operating this type of program are now able to apply automated data mining uh, algorithms to dragnet a potentially limitless universe of communications traffic by placing taps on fiber optic cables through which the majority of digital communications uh, travel, uh, these states have been able to conduct mass surveillance of content and metadata, providing intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the opportunity to monitor and record not only their own citizens' communications, uh, but also the communications of individuals located uh, in other states. Uh, this capacity is typically reinforced uh, by mandatory data retention laws in many parts of the world that require telecommunications and internet service providers to preserve communications data for inspection and analysis. The use of scanning software, profiling criteria and search terms then enables the relevant authorities to filter vast quantities of stored information in order to identify patterns of communication between individuals and organizations. Automated data mining algorithms link common identifying names, locations, uh, numbers and IP addresses and look for correlations, geographical intersections of location data uh, and patterns in online, social uh, and other relationships. In that way, states with high levels of internet penetration can gain access to the telephone and email content of an effectively unlimited number of users and maintain an overview of internet uh, activity associated with particular uh, web pages or addresses. And all of that is possible without any prior human suspicion related to a specified individual or organization. It's no exaggeration to say that the communications of literally every internet user are potentially open for inspection by intelligence and law enforcement uh, agencies uh, in the states concerned. And that amounts to a systematic interference with the right to respect for the privacy of communications and requires at the least a correspondingly compelling justification if it's going to meet uh, the requirements of international law. And that's where the counter-terrorism uh, justification is said uh, to come in. Uh, but the, the important point from, uh, for the purposes of Article 17 it is that mass surveillance without prior suspicion involves no target-specific justification. Uh, and it's therefore going to be incumbent on states uh, who are seeking to justify these measures as proportionate to justify not an individual interference by reference to the facts of a particular investigation, but rather to justify the general practice of seeking bulk access to digital communications on a wholesale scale. The scale of the interference with individual and collective privacy rights of all internet users clearly calls for a competing policy justification of analogical magnitude. Uh, as an absolute minimum, Article 17 of the Covenant, which is the equivalent uh, of Article 8 of the European Convention, uh, requires states using mass surveillance technology to give, as a baseline, a meaningful public account of the tangible benefits that are said to accrue from its use. Because without a public justification, uh, there is simply no means to in ensure or measure 
the compatibility of this new practice with the requirements of the International Covenant. Uh, and yet the reality is that no state uh, has so far provided a detailed, calibrated, evidence-based justification for the scale uh, of the interference involved in, in the programs uh, that are currently in use. An assessment of proportionality involves striking a balance between the societal interest in the protection of online privacy, on the one hand, and the undoubted and unquestioned imperatives of effective counterterrorism and law enforcement on the other. Determining where that balance uh, is to be struck requires an informed public debate to take place within and between states. The international community, which is now grappling uh, slowly and behind the curve with the development in this technology, uh, now needs squarely to confront uh, the revolution that is necessarily taking place in our collective understanding of the right to privacy. Because any assessment of proportionality has to take full account of the fact uh, that the internet now represents the ubiquitous means of communication for many millions of people uh, around the world. Anyone who wishes to participate in the exchange of information and ideas in the modern world of global communications is nowadays obliged to use transnational digital uh, communications uh, technology. Uh, the use of, of mass surveillance programs of this kind uh, undoubtedly, in my view and in the view of the Office of the High Commissioner, impinges on the very essence of the right to privacy of online communications. It is potentially inconsistent with the core principles that states should adopt the least intrusive means available when entrenching uh, on protected human rights. It excludes any individualized proportionality assessment before uh, an intrusion takes place uh, and currently uh, is hedged around by secrecy claims that make any form of proportionality uh, analysis uh, extremely difficult. There are no limits to the categories of persons uh, who may be subject to surveillance, and there are no limitations on its duration. Crucially, the states engaging in mass digital surveillance have so far failed to provide uh, any detailed or evidence-based public justification for its necessity, and almost no states have enacted explicit domestic legislation to authorise its use. Uh, that state of affairs, uh, should it remain the position, comes close to derogating from the right to privacy altogether in relation to digital communications uh, without any state having lodged uh, a relevant instrument of derogation. For all of those reasons, mass surveillance of digital content and communications data, at the very least, presents a serious challenge for what is an established norm of international law. Uh, it is simply incompatible with existing concepts of privacy for states to collect all communications or metadata all the time uh, indiscriminate, in, indiscriminately. Uh, the very essence uh, of the right to privacy of communications uh, is that infringements must be exceptional uh, and must be justified uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. There may be, as I said earlier, a compelling counter-terrorism justification for the radical re-evaluation of internet privacy rights that these practices necessitate. But the arguments in favor of what amounts to a complete abrogation of the right to privacy on the internet have not been made by the states concerned and have not been subject to informed scrutiny or debate. Um, the central recommendation in the report that I put before uh, uh, the General Assembly in October uh, it is that states should revise and update domestic legislation to ensure consistency with the right to privacy uh, in Article 17. Uh, but more specifically, that since these programs involve uh, interference with the privacy rights of the entire digital community, nothing short of detailed and explicit primary legislation should suffice. Not generic enabling powers, but powers which are spelt out in terms and which involve clear transparency about the degree of internet penetration 
uh, that a state uh, is engaged in uh, on behalf of its citizens. A public legislative process, that is to say debates within national parliaments, uh, provide an opportunity for governments to be transparent about their methodology and to seek to persuade their public of the justification for what it is that they are doing. It also enables the public to appreciate the balance that is being struck between privacy and security in their name. Uh, uh, so so uh, the way forward is uh, certainly new laws at a national level, uh, and indeed from the UN's perspective, that is a necessary next step. Um, but one of the questions that people always ask me, and I'll just throw it out at this point and, and, and perhaps we can pick it up later, is, is there any potential for an international agreement or treaty uh, in this field to regulate internet governance, given that um, uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of surveillance is transnational in character? The short answer to that uh, um, is no. Uh, it, it is almost inconceivable uh, that we will reach a point where there is sufficient consensus internationally to move forward with a treaty that's of any meaning uh, uh, um, or, or indeed any other form of international agreement. But what we do have, uh, for what it is worth, and it's an extremely valuable technique uh, uh, and tool for campaigning organisations, is a commitment amongst a large number of member states, roughly 60, to keep this issue at the very top of the international agenda at the UN. So we had our, the, the, the process kicked off, as I said, with the resolution in 2013. Immediately on the back of my report and the High Commissioner's report, Germany and Brazil uh, um, uh, have sponsored another resolution for the Human Rights Council, which is aimed to keep the matter at the very forefront of international debate. But the work in, in the end that needs to be done uh, in order to bring some form of accountability to this process is going to have to happen within a national or regional framework. And we're going to hear uh, in just a moment how, how some of those steps uh, have been taken. Uh, but that means politically, it means raising public awareness, it means events like this, it means films like Citizen Four, it means getting people interested and supportive beh uh, 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 behind uh, campaigns, it means getting people to realise that privacy actually matters. Uh, and, of course, it means also the litigation uh, which is being conducted with varying degrees of success on both sides of the Atlantic and in the European Court of Human Rights. So I'll move, uh, give way now to the next speaker who can elucidate some of those issues.